Coming up in today's newscast, new evidence in case 4000 is published. The United Nations passes another six resolutions condemning Israel and ignoring non-Muslim ties to Jerusalem. And at least 40 doctors, interns, pharmacists, and other medical professionals in Israel have now been arrested for practicing under fake licenses. In the wake of yesterday's police announcement, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has now been recommended for indictments on charges of bribery, graft, breach of trust, and more in cases 1,000, 2,000, and now 4,000. Attorney General Abichai Mandelblit now only has to review the three cases presented to his office, after which he'll give the final say on whether or not to indict. But Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to denounce the investigations, calling them a baseless witch hunt. In fact, the Prime Minister argued that the police had, quote, decided what the outcome would be and leaked their conclusions, end quote, a full year before the investigation was completed. But Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to denounce the investigations, calling them a baseless witch hunt. In fact, the Prime Minister argued that the police had, quote, decided what the outcome would be and leaked their conclusions, end quote, a full year before the investigation was completed. <laughs> של המלצות שנקבעו מראש, הדלפות מגמתיות, תהליך נגוע, סיפורי שב, עליי ועל רעייתי, בחירים שאיתו חוקרים, משחק מחור מראש. ולכן ההמלצה לא מפתיעה, והעיתוי לא מפתיעה. וגם כאן, אתם יודעים איך זה יסתיים. לא יהיה כלום. The Prime Minister even just posted a Hanukkah greeting video in which he brushes off the cases against him in an ill-timed joke. It's unclear when the video was filmed, but in it, Netanyahu approaches a man in a donut shop where he jokes about having the police called on him for no reason. The man he's speaking to quips, it's case 5000, to which the Premier responds, leave it, who's even counting? <laughs> but the Lachav 433 anti-corruption unit, which conducted the investigations against Netanyahu, his wife Sara, and Bezik controlling shareholder Shaul Elevich and his wife Iris, have now presented supposed mounds of evidence that they say can take the Prime Minister and all the other suspects to trial. Primarily the two states' witnesses, Nilchefetz and Ilan Yeshua, who provided supposed physical evidence and testimony to police. Chefetz, who was Netanyahu's former media advisor, allegedly acted as a go-between for Netanyahu and those at Bezik Telecommunications and Walla News. As for Yeshua, Walla News' CEO, the case essentially began thanks in part to his testimony. He was instructed by his boss and now suspect in case 4000 Shaul Elevich to destroy his phone, and with it, any evidence of impropriety. Instead, he took his phone to an attorney, eventually releasing it to police with supposed great relief to be rid of it. Regardless of the outcome, however, opposition MKs like Tsipi Livni charged that the Prime Minister's rhetoric is damaging the state confidence in the police, tweeting, quote, If you're ever in distress and need the police, remember it's Netanyahu that is trying to weaken this agency, end quote. Thankfully, however, the country's faith in the justice system hasn't been shaken quite to that extent just yet. I do have faith in our justice system, and I believe that if Bibi's guilty, then he will be brought to justice. I think there's something Conflict between elected government officials and appointed so-called gatekeepers in Israel has been rising consistently over the last few years, with those elected to power now again questioning how appointees seem to have so much more power than they do. The issue is especially relevant now following infighting between Deputy Attorney General Dina Zilber and Justice Minister Elit Shaked. Zilber today appeared at a Knesset committee hearing in spite of Shaked saying that she would take her place over politically charged statements that Zilber previously made. And joining me now with more is Attorney Gal Babayov. Gal, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for inviting. All right, so first of all, you know, t tell us a little bit about this problem. What is it? You know, could you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. Basically, what we've seen in the past decade in Israel is in expansion of power by appointed officials who have taken the power to themselves. The guidelines for Israeli's public service is very simple. An attorney, an, uh, any elected official has the power to do 
what he's been elected to, is legislate. But we have these appointed officials, it could be lawyers, they could be general managers of sort, that have taken powers that have not been issued to them for the fact that they feel that they need to be a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper that means they will we'll have to keep the balance between what the legislative branch wants to do and what we or they feel they deem should be done. Is that not, to a degree at least, is that not what these gatekeepers or these appointees are supposed to do? Are they not supposed to balance out government to any degree? They're supposed to balance out between legislative needs and what we'll call a political agenda is of every minister in the, minister, in the various ministers. But the problem is that we've seen an expansion of powers that have been taken by these appointed officials by saying we cannot defend an elected government's decisions or a minister's cause of action to a point where they are frightened to go into court to defend a minister's idea or way of thinking or even a decree that has been signed. But again, you know, I, I kind of want to press that a little bit further. You know, let's, let's take the attorney general or, you know, our, our court, court appointees. You know, if, if an elected official who may not have a background in law legislates something that maybe negates a previous law or acts against it or maybe against uh, laws that, uh, or, 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 or agreements that Israel agreed to internationally, isn't, again, isn't it their job to say, this is indefensible, we can't do that? Talking about elected officials is one thing. When talking about appointed officials at various crossroads, and we'll take the legal aspect, which is something I a little bit understand, and we'll talk about it. The official guidelines from the, of the Israeli Public Service states that a consulate officer has to ensure that the minister will be able to implement his way of thinking or his policies by, the, by means of law. It means it's a very clear-cut case. It has to be black and white. You do not have to put anything that is more, we'll call it, deferral of politics or policies mm -hmm. to a way that we say that is very simple. There's the law. You have to abide by these certain laws. I cannot go in and say, listen, you want to do something that's a bit different, I won't protect you, or I won't go into court and t talk about that point. So, okay, how, how is this affecting the government's ability to function? The government appoints legal officials in order for them to consult the various branches, the legislative ban branch or the government branch, the, the government itself. Sure. If these appointed officials take the liberty to go off point, to give their personal opinions, to give their personal values into a conscious decision that they have to make, we are at a point where an elected official, a minister, cannot effectively act out the duties that he was elected for, to the point mm -hmm. where we've seen this very disturbing argument between Minister Shaked and Vice uh, Gen Attorney General Zil Silber, sure. two very important figures in the Ministry of Justice, arguing about the fact that one person is giving her political or her viewpoints into what has to be policy. All right. Well, uh, Gada, thank you so much for coming in today and, uh, and sharing you. your insights with us. Thank you. All right, moving on. Ahead of the Hanukkah celebrations this week, the United Nations General Assembly in New York last Friday approved six anti-Israel resolutions out of the typical 20 or so that are passed every year by the UNGA against the Jewish state. But this time around, again, none of the six resolutions condemned Hamas or other terror groups, and indeed two of them completely ignored any Jewish ties to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem's Old City. The Temple Mount, of course, is the site of the first and second Jewish temple, and it's considered the holiest place on earth for Jews. But the temple's ruins today lie beneath the Haram al-Sharif Mosque, which is why Jews worldwide come to pray at the western wall uh, of the Temple Mount complex. No Jewish prayers allowed by Muslims or Israeli officials atop the uh, Temple Mount, and offenders are often arrested. Now, the two main resolutions regarding Jerusalem passed with around 150 votes each, and they both condemn Israel's sovereignty in Jerusalem. Additionally, neither of the resolution's texts acknowledge Jewish or Christian ties to the Temple Mount, calling it only by the Muslim name Haram al-Sharif. Noah Furman, the Israeli deputy permanent representative at the UN, said that, quote, this omission was deliberate, and shows yet another instance of the Palestinians' refusal to recognize the proven historical connection between Judaism, Christianity, the Temple Mount, and Jerusalem as a whole. The international community must stop participating in such blatant denial of history. You must not permit these blatant attempts to delegitimize Israel, end quote. As for the other four resolutions, they challenged Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights, called on Israel to return to negotiations on the basis of pre-1967 borders, and shored up support for Palestinian committees and divisions within the UN. Only the United States, Canada, and Australia voted with Israel against all six resolutions, with United States Deputy Political Coordinator Leslie Orderman saying that this trend is unacceptable. He said, quote, 
Again, we see resolutions that are quick to condemn all manner of Israeli actions, but say almost nothing about Palestinian terrorist attacks against innocent civilians. This is particularly acute now, when the rocket attacks on November 12th saw more projectiles fired on a single day than on any day since 2014, end quote. To that end, Orderman also announced the first ever standalone resolution condemning Hamas and other militant terror groups in the area, and it's slated for a vote at the General Assembly on Friday. The EU is expected to support the text. On a related note, Palestinians who work in Israel are now protesting against the Palestinian Authority following a recently passed Palestinian social security law. The law, which was passed last month by President Abbas's presidential decree, forms the Palestinian Social Security Corporation, which will be charged with handling social security and other related benefits for Palestinians living in the West Bank. But Palestinian workers and critics of the law both are now calling on Israel's Labor Federation, or the Histadult, not to comply with the new Palestinian law. Aside from the fact that it was not passed through the normal, proper channels, most Palestinians also don't trust their own government to properly handle the, the benefits either. Protester Mohammed Taha put it bluntly that, quote, the PA clearly wants to steal our money and that we don't know where our money will be, in, where, where it will be invested, and we don't know who is managing the investments either, end quote. 42-year-old protester Hussein Al-Qasim similarly said, quote, we don't need or trust their so-called social security fund while we are under occupation, end quote. He continued that it's time the Labor Federation proves that it works within the law to protect the rights of its workers. But Palestinian officials, on the other hand, say that while the new law does need some fixing, quote, it doesn't mean we go ask help from the enemy, end quote. Still, this comes after taxes collected by Israel in addition to other funds have been withheld from the Palestinian Authority on the grounds that they pay terrorists with it. These withheld taxes account for nearly 12% of the Palestinian Authority's annual revenue, but that just goes to further the point of the protesters, that if the Palestinian Authority gets the money, they'll probably never see it again. There are currently about 100,000 Palestinians working for Israeli companies, both in the West Bank and in Israel proper. Fake news is a phrase we hear a lot these days, but it's not often in reference to something tangible. Well, according to Israeli intelligence startup ClearSky, 98 fake news sites operating in 29 different languages have just been linked to Iranian operators, and Al-TV's Doreen Mizrahi is here to tell us more about it. Doreen? Hey, Aaron. So Clear Sky released a report like this back in 2017, and they released another one on Friday. It's fake news sites in 20 line, 29 languages targeting 28 countries. Fake news. Fake news promoting <laughs> Iranian so, government. It's crazy. Okay, yeah. How did, how did they figure out, how did Clear Sky figure out that these were fake news sites? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there were phone numbers that they called that didn't even work. Um, they checked, like, the maps. They landed on roads, not even buildings. There's this agency where all the, all the news sites were getting images, videos, comics, everything from. They tried calling the news site, nothing. They tried emailing them, it bounced back. Um, they're supposedly sit in Tehran. No one found them, they asked locals, no one heard about them. So yeah, all of this. So a lot of evidence that points to them not really existing. A lot of evidence. All right, well, you know, what, what was kind of reoccurring on these sites? You know, what did, like, because you, you mentioned maybe yeah. some, fi some facts and figures or some photos right. maybe that they were so sharing. So there were like words that kept in the web URL. There was like news, times, journal. There was even three Hebrew sites. Like three Hebrew, Hebrew sites. Hebrew sites. And one even called the Times of Tel Aviv that has 65,000 people coming into the website every month. So wow, so they're getting a lot of they're traffic. Getting a lot it's of not traffic. like it's not only political news. Like they they're smart about it. They put in other news and and not all, not only politically Some oriented so people can can believe this is real, but in the end it's like people are actually looking at news that is it's fake. Okay, and then and then in the news itself, you know, was it was it incorrect? Was it misleading? What you know, what what was Okay, so it was very like anti-Western government, anti-democracy, anti-Zionism. They were mainly attacking Israel and Saudi Arabia. Wow. Yeah. All right. So, all right, that's, that's absurd. It is absurd. How, do, how did this go Ten, on for so long without being caught? So it goes, it's since 2012 these sites are running. And, wow. okay, so now, like, Facebook, Google, all these Alphabet, Google-owned company, um, they're all looking at this and they're developing algorithms to put these sites down. Just last month, Facebook put down 82 pages linked to the Iranian government that were, wow. were false and, and people promoting news that isn't real. So these companies are working on it. All right. Well, I guess I can't say this enough to everybody at home, but don't take one news source. Yeah. To... See where your news is coming yeah. from. See the sources. And cross-check. Definitely. Dariel, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Aaron.
All right, in shocking reports on Sunday, Israeli police arrested 40 Arab Israeli citizens on suspicion of functioning as doctors, medical interns, and pharmacists without proper training or certification. The suspects are all thought to have purchased fake medical certificates in Armenia after failing to complete their, to complete their studies in European countries. And they were arrested in their homes and at work. Police suspect that these so-called medical professionals used an Israeli agent to connect to Armenian institutions in order to get these documents. And the certifications claimed that the individuals in question had completed their studies in Armenia, despite not meeting academic standards necessary to have done so. Then, the suspects presented these fake documents in Israel in order to enter their chosen medical fields. Some even went on to pass the Israel Health Ministry's licensing exam and started working. According to the police, the Israeli broker who got the certificates also got one for himself while he was at it, and as of their arrests, suspects were working in hospitals and medical departments as interns and residents, and in some cases were even just self-employed. One suspect, for example, who apparently already spent time in prison for security-related offenses, was operating his own dental practice. In a statement released by the health ministry, Israeli officials now say that they're under no obligation to recognize Armenian certifications and have already announced intent to drop recognition over any certificates from the universities of Mechital Gosh and St. Teresa, where all of the suspects reportedly got their documents from. The real estate market is a tough one, and making truly informed decisions as opposed to general educated guesses is a complicated process, especially when you might lack all the variables relating to particular properties, regions, owners, loans, etc. Well, Israeli-based company Credify allows companies to strategize through a unique data-driven platform that aggregates data for commercial real estate. And with us today is the Credify Senior Managing Director, uh, Jason Rausman. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me on your platform. It's my pleasure. All right, so Jason, you know, tell us a little bit about Credify and how it works. Sure, so Credify is a big data platform that leverages technology to gather a lot of information on commercial real estate. Commercial real estate includes properties, the owners associated with those properties, loans and the lenders who are making those loans as well as tenants and other assets as well so all, all the metadata so to speak regarding you know relating to uh, to assets are, are around any sort of property essentially yes and and this information is very useful to different segments within the industry so for example lenders will find this very interesting because hey they want to know what's going on in a particular market what kind of market share do they have what are their competitors are doing? What kind of opportunities may they have? Um, we also sell very much so to uh, hedge funds and asset managers. So if they're trading equities, they want to know what a particular pu publicly traded lender might be up to. So what can we do? We can say, hey, this lender has been lending in this area on this property type. Uh, they may have certain risk outliers that could be helpful for the trader. And they also may, uh, we are also able to provide certain predictive analysis as to what may be their activity moving forward. So, okay, you know, so is this really to help navigate uh, you know, a certain market, or is it also to kind of make sure that other people are, are up to snuff? Sure, good question. So essentially, commercial real estate has traditionally been a very opaque market. People shake hands, they see brick and mortar. So what Credify tried to do is provide a certain level of transparency. So with all this data that we're collecting, we essentially allow businesses to be more efficient, make decisions as to what markets they may want to get involved with, which relationship with, with which owners they may want to work with, uh, what kind of loans they may want to make. So essentially, Credify empowers companies and individuals to say, hey, this is a deal we may want to make. This is a this is a market we may want to enter. And it's it sounds like it would be less risky as well. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, the, the more, more, the more the, guess. exactly. The more transparency you have, the lower the lower the risk is. Wow. All right. So you said you mentioned that you're working with hedge funds. You're working with uh, you know with, with independent uh, co contractors. This sort of thing, like with everybody. Sure. So we're also working with brokers who love us because we have opportunities for them. We can make sure. introductions through our data. Um, regulators like us as well because hey, they don't know what's going on in the market. That's you're what they're clear, supposed to be doing. The we, we can sure. we can give them that type of information as well. That's incredible. All right. So now I understand there's also kind of like this culture. Sure. That, you, that you're very proud of the surrounding your company. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So Credify is duly located, meaning we have offices here in Israel, and we also have offices in New York. So that in of itself is an interesting culture uh, blend. Sure. But uh, essentially here in Israel, uh, it's a lot of fun. First of all, our, our, we have great people that work at Credify, specifically a lot of top elite, uh, a, lot, a lot of native Israelis who are from top elite army units and uh, our native Anglos over here are people, who, individuals who worked on Wall Street, whether it was wow. at accounting firms or traders or uh, ratings analytics. So that in of itself is very interesting and interesting combined. But um, 
You'll, you'll always hear the foosball table being played at Credify. So uh, if you like to play foosball, you'll have a playmate at Credify. Uh, additionally, I would say uh, our happy hours are legendary. So once a week, uh, it's a lot of fun to work there. And even as we speak right now, I'm sitting here, I'm missing a Hanukkah party because uh, they're, they're serving oh, us. <laughs> they're serving uh, the rest of our uh, families. Uh, um, That's awesome. Yes, latkes and uh, donuts. So a very fun place to work and uh, I'm very... Uh, and it makes it... it, makes it it makes it that much better. It makes it less work, really. Less work, but I wouldn't say less work. I think it makes us more efficient. In other words, when sure. you combine that level of culture and, and, and the idea is we have a product to sell and we have the best, the best possible features to put out there, and you combine that with a little bit of fun and just this openness and diverse cultures, it really makes it a, a very unique place to work. Incredible. All right, well, Jason, thank you so much for telling us more about this. It's really cool. Absolutely. And, and I'm happy to hear about you know, the way you work at your, at your uh, company. Not everybody does that, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, if you're interested in Credify, check it out. It's, it's amazing. Thank you so much for coming in. All the best. Thank you. All right. Now, last night marked the first night of Hanukkah this year, and hundreds gathered to mark the occasion outside the Pittsburgh Tree of Life Synagogue, where 11 congregants were murdered on October 27th. The synagogue held a public lighting of their menorah out front and also took a moment to honor the victims of the attack with a makeshift memorial. Thousands visited to pay their respects pray, sing, and otherwise just be present for the lighting of the menorah in solidarity with the Jewish community. Thousands visited to pay their respects, pray, sing, and otherwise just be present for the lighting of the menorah in solidarity with the Jewish community. Rabbi Myers, who was conducting the services at the Tree of Life Synagogue at the time of the mass shooting, said, quote, I don't think that there are enough adjectives to describe the community support, end quote. And indeed, in the months since the massacre, many public figures, Jewish and not, have also offered their support, especially as anti-Semitism globally is on the rise. Israeli basketball player Omri Kaspi, for example, said he felt safe in the United States, but was confronted with violent protesters in Europe and sometimes played with no fans just for safety reasons. New England Patriots receiver Julian Edelman also went public with an Israeli baseball cap for a shout-out to Pittsburgh after a victory over the Green Bay Packers. In that same interview, he said, quote, I'm proud of who I am and what I am. Just to let these victims know, we're all with you. This is a very tough time for you, I can't even imagine. But you have support, end quote. On a related note, in an equally somber but beautiful gesture, the family of murdered Israeli advocate Ari Fold was joined by the woman Fold rescued for a candlelighting ceremony of their own at the scene of the attack in Gush Etzion. After being stabbed, Fold ran after the terrorist and shot him in order to save the rest of the people in the area. It was thanks to this action that the falafel shop worker Hila Peretz was spared a similar fate. She was quoted saying, quote, The man that was killed, Ari Fold, really saved my life. He's not just a hero, he gave his life for me, end quote. Meanwhile, Robert Bowers, the shooter in the Pittsburgh attack, pleaded not guilty to murder and hate crimes charges. He remains in jail without bail. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Since an Israeli startup just found 98 fake Iranian news sites, we thought today's word should be chadashot or the news. Chadashot or the news are typically chadash or new, and you can get your news or chadashot on television, websites, social media, and a variety of other applications as well. But the news or Chadashot should be objective, factually based, free from as much bias as possible, and of course ethical in practice. That's why the rising reports of fake Chadashot or news worldwide is so troublesome. So remember, check multiple sources and with different agendas or political leanings if you have any hope of getting a full picture. Now, for our second night of Hanukkah, please join me, if you will, for a quick candle lighting. Again, we have a Chanukiah, this time with two candles. Kippa and shamash. So we're gonna light shamash candle. All right, here we go. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu le'adlik ner Chanukah. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, sh'asa nisim l'avotenu b'yamim ahem b'zman hazeh. Oh, very nice. Don't forget to burn the bottoms, people. Don't forget to burn the bottoms. All right, now we have six days of Hanukkah left, and then of course we start gearing up for the Christmas season. So send in your videos of candles or tree lighting for a chance to have it featured on our program. And with that, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy with a chance of scattered showers and a low of 59 or 15 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow you can expect partly cloudy and sunny skies and a slight drop in temperatures to a high of around 69 or 21 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.72 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you for watching.